Um, so we, we're joined now uh, by a panel and we're going to be talking about a subject matter. So there's two, two things that we're covering here that are really close to my heart. Uh, for those of you that know me, you'll know that I actually came out of the music industry uh, originally. Um, and actually, when you work with artists and you work in the creative industries or in cultural organisations, the truth is you can't create anything unless you work together. You need to come together as a collective to be able to do that. And even when I interviewed for this role, I remember being asked a question, well, what experience have you got of working with co-ops? And I said, every band I've ever managed, <laughs> because that is the truth. And there's something inherent when you make a piece of art, a piece of music, a piece of film, when you make a business. Actually, what happens, the control around the art... It becomes really important. And I've seen on many occasions creativity get stifled uh, because the ownership model isn't working for the artist. So we're going to explore that. And then the second thing that's really important to me, and it's going to be the theme of the afternoon, is around devolved power, actually. Uh, we have mentioned there's a general election uh, coming up. And what's been significant uh, over uh, the last uh, kind of not quite a decade yet um, but devolved powers and in our regions, and we're doing a lot of work uh, in, in Cooperatives UK around this. So it's how we can put the energy into people coming together and actually put the support in to enable more cooperation, particularly in the creative industries in the West Midlands, but you'll hear all about that uh, shortly. I've got an amazing host again. Uh, again, we met through the creative industries originally on that screen in the pandemic <laughs> um, but it's wonderful to have our cultural consultant our host can i please welcome lara ratnaraja Uh, thank you very much, Rose, and um, thank you for knowing how to pronounce my surname, uh, which was, uh, she went, it's, it's just as, you, as it's spelt, isn't it? And I thought, first person that said that in about 10 years, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very pleased with that. Um, I'm Lara Atnaraja, I'm a freelance consultant. I, I live in Birmingham, um, but I work all across the UK, um, and I work in the creative industries. Um, particularly, I work in place-based cultural strategies, so kind of culture that is relevant to towns and cities. And I particularly have a focus on work that is um, around and centred around inclusion and diversity. Um, in my spare time, of which I have none, um, I also run um, All Saints Community Catering, a co run, sorry, um, All Saints Community Catering, which is a community benefit society, um, very similar to a cooperative, and we deliver community meals um, across King's Heath. Uh, to, not just to, we started off in lockdown to vulnerable, vulnerable and shielding people. And now we do, um, as the cost of living crisis increase, we do, we have a, about 110 people come for a Sunday lunch, for example, and we do a big, big roast lunch. Um, so I do that as well. Um, and all of that kind of, I suppose, links into the kind of work that I do in the creative industries. And we thought we'd actually, um, hands up who knows what the creative industries are. Very small number. Does it, presumably all the panel knows. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so according to the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, creative industries are those industries which have their origin in individual creativity, skill and talent, and which have a potential for wealth and job creation through the generation and exploitation of intellectual property. It covers advertising, marketing, film, TV, video, radio, photography, music, performing and visual arts, museum, galleries and libraries, but also architecture, craft, design and design of fashion, IT, software and publishing. And also, that's all the people that work in the sector, but also creativity means people who also participate in creative endeavours for pleasure, not just for economic income. So the creative industries are obviously culturally and socially important, but they are also very important economically. In 2022, provisional estimates show that the DTMS sector has contributed nearly £170 billion to the UK economy, which is 7.7% of the total UK GVA. And the economic value of the UK creative industries was 12% bigger in 2022 than before the COVID pandemic. And it accounts for nearly 1 million jobs, and that's presumably not including freelancers, of which the sector is made up of many. Now, these are all very big numbers. But what we want to talk about today was how much of that filters down to those who work in the sector, to their communities, and also how that reflects their values. So we have a very esteemed panel today who are going to help us understand the role of co-ops in the creative and cultural sector. So we have Lucinda Broadbent, who is Director of Media Co-op, Ben Philp, Creative Director of Creative Co-op, Lena Habibala, Member of Not Nowhere Co-op, 
uh, Joe Ind, who's a freelancer, but also the coordinator of the Western Midlands Ownership Hub. And also, finally, Rich Parker, Labour and Cooperative Party Mayor for the Western Midlands. So I'm going to pass over to Lucinda first, and then everyone's going to kind of explain about how they work with co-ops in their part, particular part of the sector. So Lucinda, and we have a short film. It's made me very confident. Like many students, I have a dream to succeed. We are all following our dreams. Are you? I work here for what and computers. I do things myself to help people know I can do it. It's like I can see myself falling for ages and I can't stop myself. We feel quite like, oh, what is those equipment? We really need to do that. I always thought if it happened to me, I'd fight back. But actually, I just froze. See what you need me do? It's great having a secret. Making that first step can be hard, but take that deep breath and just step forward. They try to go to stay, but how do I decide? I was a child. I was a child. There was war. And we were persecuted. I had to get out. I had to get out. To save my life. To save my life. If you're going to make a success of a campaign, first of all, you've got to discover the truth, and the truth is very often kept secret. Oh. <laughs> to see what they've done in such a short time, absolutely amazing. I'm sorry. I'm one of the founders of Media Co-op. We're a workers' cooperative. And uh, I hope you gathered from that film that we make film, we make animation. Um, the pipes were a little cue, uh, clue that we're based in Scotland, in Glasgow. And you could probably tell there that our particular niche in the creative industries is uh, communications for social justice projects. And the other thing I hope you could see is that a thing that we do is um, seeding power and the actual hands on the cameras to the people who are uh, involved in the films, whether it's young refugees or people with disabilities or whatever. Um, so I hope nobody's come to this for tips for successful megabucks in the creative industries, because if you make the choice we made to work with cooperatives and social enterprises and charities and NHS and so on, um, it's not exactly megabucks territory, I'll confess that, but uh, we've created jobs, paid taxes, made over a thousand films, watched by millions of people, and uh, so far we're pretty solid. We've only been going 20 years, less than Ben's co-op, so obviously it's early days, um, but it's a business that's working. And uh, why did we set up as a workers' cooperative when we started working together? To be honest with you, the main reason is that most of us had been freelance before. Like, I was a freelancer in television documentary production. So I'd worked in a lot of um, non-cooperative, very commercial companies, and just been in a lot of very unhappy workplaces. So when we got together to found Media Co-op, we thought, okay, how hard can it be running a company? And we discovered, yeah, it's pretty bloody hard. Um, but the other thing we've discovered is that when you own it yourselves, there's a kind of self-responsibility that comes with that, um, which has made it work and, I have to say, has made it the happiest place I've ever worked. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Linda. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ben Phil, Creative Director at Creative Co-op. 
Um, and we do a range of design, web development, digital tools, um, and other general creative stuff, the creative kind of work. Um, and our, the market we, people we work for are generally charities, cultural organizations, social enterprises, and generally anyone doing social good um, and co-ops and everyone, that sort of, that sort of um, area. Um, and we originally, originally, what my, I originally started in the industry working in London for about eight, nine years, um, working at different design agencies, doing work for big FTSE 100 companies. Um, and although it sounded quite good, actually, that became quite, quite frustrating over sort of a period of eight, nine years. I was working for stuff people like Unilever and I was becoming quite frustrated with the hierarchy and that side of things. Um, so I was like looking for a different way of working and over time I decided to leave. I started my own, becoming a freelancer myself and through doing freelance work I discovered okay, I could work on the projects I wanted to, but I couldn't do the big ones anymore. Um, but there's also like big charities and a lot of these organizations we work with now, you couldn't work with as a freelancer. So as I was going for jobs, I was working with some of the guys at Creative Co-op. And then that sort of first year I was in freelance, they asked me to join and I became creative director then about 11 years ago. Um, and that then meant by doing, working in a co-op way, that then brought the fact that we could work with, I could still work with other people, because I really missed not work, working on my own. It was like something I really missed. Um, so I work on my own, I really missed working with other people. And having that, um, you know, being able to work with other people and do the sort of jobs you can do then with all the skills combined made a big difference. Because as it's an individual person, you can only do your, what you can do. So you needed them for people around you. So that was, that kind of the co-op model fulfilled that, but it also meant that it didn't, I didn't have to worry about all of the, um, you know, all of the sort of the negatives that I was having in the, in the previous model of the hierarchy and lots of layers and that sort of things. And we could choose the work we wanted to do. So that's how I ended up at, yeah, at Creative Co-op. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lina Habibullah. Um, I'm a member of Not Nowhere, which is an artist filmmakers cooperative in London. Um, and Not Nowhere has a long history. It's been a co-op for about 21 years now, I believe. Um, and it has a history that dates back to um, the London filmmakers uh, co-op, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and after that kind of disbanded, um, there was a bunch of analog um, equipment um, that was just lying around <laughs> that was unclaimed um, and that was very honestly just going to be destroyed and there was a lot of history attached to, the, to, the, to that equipment, there was a lot of history attached to that um, co-op um, and when it disbanded it, it became an archive which turned into Cinenova and Lux uh, which are moving image uh, archives in London and I believe there's a branch of Lux in Scotland as well. Um, and then the actual equipment went to, not, went to nowhere at the time and Lux as well. And so we inherited all of this analog equipment. Um, and initially it was just kind of about archiving and preserving uh, that equipment and the history that comes with it. But eventually it became about kind of transmitting the knowledge that was held by the London Filmmakers Corp. Um, that was kind of just like living in people's heads. <laughs> it had kind of spread out all across um, the UK and beyond. So it was about kind of trying to document that knowledge, but also trying to transmit it to a younger generation that wanted to work with analog, and that was trying to find a place for analog within an increasingly digital landscape in filmmaking. Um, and so Nowhere existed for about 15 years, um, and then the founding members were Brad Butler, Noor Afshan Mirza, and James Holcomb decided to move on to other projects, and it was inherited by the current um, uh, members of the co-op um, and it turned into Not Nowhere so we decided to call it Not Nowhere to kind of keep the memory of Nowhere but also mark that it's kind of a departure from the history of Nowhere. What we do is we organize a lot of workshops around this equipment to kind of um, empower black and brown um, artist filmmakers and artists and anyone who really wants to work with analog filmmaking 
we give them the tools to kind of, or the means to create, and the knowledge and the skills to create with, with um, analog equipment. Um, it's also a learning space for us, um, and um, we do screenings, we do trainings, um, all around the idea of analog filmmaking and making collectively. Um, I was actually a part of the community of Not Nowhere be before becoming a member. Um, I just kind of showed up to all their workshops until they were kind of sick of me. <laughs> and um, yeah, after a couple of years, I joined the co-op. Um, and I think a co-op really gives us the freedom to organize our labor within an industry that is incredibly restrictive, a film industry that's incredibly restrictive. All of us have jobs within the industry. Um, <coughs> gives us a space to reflect on those dynamics and to try to do things differently and to own the image that we make and to own our label in a different way. Um, and yeah, I think also analog specifically is quite expensive and it's very inaccessible to our communities, black or brown communities in London. Um, I know communities like a very chewed up and spat out word, <laughs> but it, we really are rooted in within our communities and so yeah, not f feeling like there's a form of expression that's not available to other black and brown artists is something that we kind of would like to change and being a co-op and being able to have honest conversations without, you know, risks that come with working in a particular institution, being able to have a direct line of communication to our uh, communities and, um, yeah, being able to create collectively without the pressure of um, it being, you know, profitable in some sense has been really, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jo. Um, I want to talk about freelancing. Um, if you don't know the creative industries, it's really important to understand the huge role that freelancing plays within it. It is something that characterizes our industries. The figures say that there's double the number of freelancers in the creative industries in comparison to the rest of the economy. I'm skeptical about that, to be honest, because it seems far higher than that to me. And certainly in film and TV, you're talking about something like 80%. Um, and it's really important to understand that in order to understand the challenges that there are in the creative industries. It has all sorts of implications. First of all, I'll just explain why it's so heavily freelance. Um, I'll just take an example from film and TV. So if you want to make a movie, a film, you've got to get funding. How you fund it, how you get that money up front, is incredibly complicated. There's all sorts of legal transactions that you have to go through, estimating how much you're going to make from merch, how much you're going to make from onward distribution, and so on and so on. And during that process, it is um, confidential. You, it's highly commercially sensitive. You can't go blagging about it. There comes a point when the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed on all those legal deals, and then a point where it is greenlit. And at that point, you say, right, where are our heads of department? Get our heads of department into place, get our next people. All these people are freelancers. And you haven't got, you've never got enough time to actually make your film. So this has to be done incredibly quickly. And what this means is that you've got people working in bars, people cycling, doing your Uber Eats, and all of this kind of stuff, who are the life force of the creative industries. These are the highly skilled animators, um, makeup artists, who are jobbing it, waiting for the next big gig to come along. That's how the industry works. It's partly in the nature of it. And what that means is, for us, we're very fragile. Um, we're not because we're creative, and that gives us a wonderful robustness. But it has implications for skills. Who's training these people? Apprenticeships, for example. Well, you have to, in order to have an apprenticeship, you have to 
be taken on for a year. Well, we don't employ anybody for a year in the creative industries, not in film and TV. That's, that's a big ask. We can't do it, so the apprenticeship model doesn't work for us. So the other problem that it creates is a problem of access, because, of course, you're very vulnerable at the beginning of your career. It's very difficult to earn money, and that means that the people that can hack it are the people that have got the bank of mum and dad, the people that live in London and the South East, where most of the film and TV industry is. So if you're from a poor background in the North, North East, it's going to be really, really difficult for you. And that then affects the content that gets made. It means that the stories from those kinds of backgrounds don't get told because they're not owning it, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I just want to explain that so we can see what kind of territory we're in. I'm a freelancer. I've, I've always had a freelance element to my portfolio. I'm a writer. Um, by background, I started off in the creative industries writing a book as soon as I came out of the university, um, then went on to do my second one. I know what it is to incubate an idea and to be all by myself, and nobody's read the whole thing until the publisher sees it. A t very, very solitary thing. Um, and what I've discovered I love even more than that solitariness is working with and I love I, I just love working with a visual artist how can words and image play together um, tomorrow those of you that are still here you'll see a wonderful performance by Birmingham's poet laureate Jasmine Gardodi and Dance Cooperative Birmingham which I helped to produce and that cooperation that What's the role of the body? What's the role of words? When are we going to let words lead? When are we going to let the body lead? Oh, that is delicious stuff for me. And so I'm really happy to be in spaces where we can use all the art forms, all our senses, and create something that is even more delicious than it would be on our own. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you, Jo. <laughs> Richard. Okay, so no, thank you for inviting me today. So I am I'm very proud to be the Labour and Cooperative Mayor for the West Midlands, and my manifesto contained a commitment to support the growth of co-ops across the region. And uh, I'm, I'll set out some of my thoughts around this sector, but also some of the things you need to do to support the growth of co-ops and cooperative working, uh, and we need to create more models. But I'm also here to listen and learn today more about, more about this sector. And... Um, and I'm not an expert on anything anymore, so actually the best way I can succeed <laughs> is genuinely having the best people around me, and that's the nature of, the nature of politics. So we start off perhaps with a recognition of some of the challenges we face structurally in this region uh, around disadvantage and lack of opportunity. We have uh, got one of the worst performing regional economies here in the country. We've got more young people out of work than any other region in the country. In fact, we've got double the number of young people out of work than most of the regions. And, and we've got um, around a quarter of the workforce with low skills or no skills. That blights people's lives. It means they've got lives of low pay and they suffer all the anxieties and vulnerabilities we go with that. And those folks come from the poorest bits of the region. So my, my approach to the region and what we need to do differently is around giving more of those people access to opportunity, to get access to skills they need, to make the best of themselves and help them overcome some of those disadvantages that, um, that blight the lives, I said, of too many people. Uh, and beyond the, uh, I'll come back to the challenge we've got around the skill system uh, in a second, but it's also then how, uh, if we support the development of those skills, how we help those people access the jobs of the future and the best way they can work together collectively to, um, to, to access those skills and those jobs. So, the training system, we talked about apprenticeship issues, uh, are fundamental to addressing the problems we've got uh, in, the, in the West Midlands and helping many of those young people uh, get access to the pathways that could make a difference in their lives. And there are some great programmes set up uh, by the Combined Authority. Uh, one I went to visit recently was a Path to Apprenticeship programme, 
which is helping kids. And they were, in, that, in that case, it was people, you know, kids who were training or looking at access to the construction industry, but this model can apply to all sectors. So and I met the first cohort of those young people. They were now 19. They'd not worked. They'd left school with no qualifications. And these programmes were helping them uh, develop the skills that help them give access to apprenticeships. And that was in the construction sector. I would li like to see that model rolled out uh, to creative industries too. Uh, the people I'd met, this was changing their lives. I did some media afterwards. And I, talked, I was about to say that everyone needed a second chance. Those folks hadn't had the first chance in life. So um, for me, it is about creating that platform to help people succeed. And the best way we can help people succeed is putting designing programs of training and learning that um, reflect the things that are of interest to them, and then helping create pathways that will help them succeed in, in, um, in those professions and in those sectors. And this sector is absolutely fabric to the future success of our region. And we've got many young, talented people that um, have trained here and want to come back here to help and want to drive these sectors forward. Over the last, and I, uh, this approach to skills and opportunity uh, is, will be embedded as we go forward into, I hate the phrase, industrial strategy, because it sounds a bit you know, heavy and, and, and out of date. But it's in essence, and we all come up with some words that reflects modernity, but within that, uh, creative industries and culture will be absolutely fabric to it and by doing that we hope to knit together um, how we're going to grow those industries and support the growth, growth of those industries in the region and support people in both the training and the, the, and the skills they need to acquire but also support them in, in the way in which they, they work and access those sectors and might work together uh, collectively including through cooperatives to access those jobs. So that's, that's sort of the, the broader platform. The really exciting bit for me is uh, the amount of talent in this region that we can support and the potential. So over the last two weeks, I've met S Stephen Knight three times to talk about his plans in Digbeth, and uh, they are incredible and really, really ambitious. And some of the, um, the officers that combined authority and a number in this room are helping me, uh, helping us work together to support Stephen in what he wants to, to make those opportunities. But what... <laughs> Um, and I was really pleased that, that when we went to visit him in Digbeth last week, uh, the feedback was he thought it was a great meeting because we, we, we left thinking it was too. But what really gelled the conversation together wasn't you know, Stephen's ambition for uh, making films here uh, and all the work he wants to do on creating fantastic space for people to do that and producers to work, but it was about the access he wants to give and the opportunities he wants to provide for young people training and living and learning in this region. So um, using the business he's developing to attract and retain people to give them uh, the jobs they need. And that was the bit that we really uh, you know, coalesced on more than anything. And he doesn't think it's right that if we create these opportunities here, those opportunities go to people who come in just to do a programme and leave. So. The bit we're working with Stephen on is, is about creating um, some expertise that will help those who want to film here get access to the facilities and support they need. But the other issue is those training programmes that will help uh, those, those young people particularly get access to the skills they need. The other bit of support which is really important is when those people do come out of uh, their training and uh, is how they, they work collectively and collaborate to get access to those jobs. And, too many people in these sectors, and we had a very uh, good meeting, uh, I think it was earlier this week, the day's going a bit of a blur at the moment, but with, with, um, with the key unions in this region, and yeah, when they were explaining that in many of people in this industry working in this region, uh, the average salary is around £70,000, um, they described that as poverty wages, I didn't, so, um, and that is wrong too, and some of that comes from the instability and uncertainty of work, uh, as well as issues of low pay, and I see the uh, the cooperative way of working, the more cooperative model, is a way of um, enhancing pay and reward and decision making and giving those people in those industries and sectors a greater control over what they do and how they do it. So I think there is, I've got this passion to look at other models of working, support models that support the way people today want to work and uh, giving them the flexibility they want. It's also a model that I think can actually uh, raise uh, pay and reward and also give people sort of the balance, I suppose, to that work-life balance they might want. But the, the, the really important 
issue the way I can make the biggest difference to people's lives here. It is about the way in which they work and collaborate, but it's also helping create, if you like, um, the, the, in, this, in this sector, the ecosystem that gives young people particularly the opportunities they need to, to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, that's check. Do people know who Stephen Knight is? Have you all watched, uh, actually, how many people have watched Peaky Blinders? So Stephen Knight is the uh, director of uh, Peaky Blinders, which is now a kind of global um, uh, production. And he is based in Birmingham and he's winning his studios out of, out of here. Um, that's really interesting, actually, because I, I um, as a freelancer, I, and I say this, actually, I have a lot of privilege as a freelancer because I've been doing it a long time. And I can choose to work, my voluntary work, I came off all my Birmingham arts boards uh, last year to focus on the work that I do in communities because I can't do all of it. Um, and I'd rather write bids for a community food service than I would an arts organisation, quite frankly, um, because they, can, uh, they need me more. But I think there's a really interesting link between what Rich is talking about, about some of the issues we're facing in this region around uh, social disadvantage and underrepresentation. And in fact, all of you have centred your, your co-ops, um, when I was looking to, when you all talked about your work, it's all about social justice and social value. So what were the challenges each of you were facing which kind of led you to be able to work in this sort of way through a co-op? So ben, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so if one of them for me was having, you know, not having a say in the work I was doing, or also beyond the work as well, like the, how we were running the company, you know, everything in my, how I used to work before a co-op was all you know, we were given a task and we didn't really have any say if we were going to work on that type of project. We didn't get to choose, you know, how that was going to be built. Um, and another thing that led on from that as well was everyone had kind of different incentive for what they were doing. So obviously from the directors of the old company, some of them didn't really do much work, but their incentive was mainly about profit and trying to grow their share value. Um, whereas for the workers, they were more interested in actually doing interesting work. They wanted to progress in their career. Um, so everyone had a slightly different kind of agenda, and that clashed a little bit as well. Um, so that was quite a challenge, as, um, that side of things. Also, it was very hierarchical. So sometimes you go through, there could be between doing the actual work and getting to the client, there could sometimes be three or four stages. Um, and we often had very little contact with the end client and the users that were using them, what we were doing. Um, whereas, yeah, yeah, so that become quite frustrating and it's very different to how, how it is now. Um, another thing as well was, um, yeah, around sharing, you know, sharing ideas about how to change things. So we didn't really have much opportunity to share ideas and if we did, it was often kind of like, oh, well, you know, we won't worry about that because, you know, you're in that role, you're a designer, and you're not, you know, you're not a senior level management. So that became um, quite frustrating too. But they're probably some of the key things. Thank you. Lena? Um, so for many reasons, actually. I think one of them was just the nature of the film industry. Um, it's a very white industry. It's a very male-dominated industry. And... Um, yeah, it, it's, it's quite tough being in an industry like that with that um, doesn't, you know, what you were saying about freelancers coming in and out of uh, certain film projects, that work isn't always guaranteed and that you have to kind of fill in the gaps in between one project and the next. Um, and so it wasn't a reliable source of income for any of us. The few of us that did enter the film industry, I mean, the, the British Film Institute published a study not too long ago saying that only three, under 3% 3 of film workers, and that's film, all types of film workers are people of color. Um, so there's, you know, massive gap racially, but also in terms of class. I think, that, yeah, it's just the wages are really, really poor in the film industry here. Um, um, not like other places, like the US, for example, where the film industry, you know, despite its many issues, does pay well. Um, and I think also it's restrictive creatively. Um, a lot of us actually had to pivot to the art world, and those are two separate kind of worlds within the creative industries, film and art, although they overlap quite a lot. 
uh, because there's a bit more um, creative freedom in the arts, but it's even worse paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think the, there was a, a report published by Industry not too long ago saying that the average wage per hour yeah. was 2.6 pounds. And so you really can't survive in a sector like that without generational wealth, it's just impossible. Um, and at the same time, actually working with art institutions is quite difficult as well. Um, especially as an artist of color, because I think they tend to kind of use your work to sanitize their image or to kind of um, conceal a certain history in relation to artists of color. So I think not only are you doing the work for the institution to sanitize it, but you're not actually getting paid for it, you're getting paid pennies. So there was all of these different contradictions that kind of made us deeply uncomfortable working with, you know, either within the arts or the film um, space, and just not tenable, really. Like, you can't really build the life of working in these industries. Um, but we didn't want to kind of occupy the space of constant critique, because I think that is one of the symptoms of continuously facing that, is that you occupy a space of critique, and that kind of yeah. becomes a place of victimhood, almost. And you're, but we're more interested in trying to create solutions to that and to come together, because we all had a shared condition and experience. Um, so that was one of the big ones. Um, I think another thing is the nature of analog itself, is that it's quite inaccessible. Um, again, it has this impression that it's quite a white um, thing, you know, <laughs> like it's not a lot of artists of color who work with analog. Um, I think there's also a culture of like fetishism around analog because it's like this old ancient thing. Um, so that mystifies it, I think, for a lot of uh, black and brown artists. And so we wanted to kind of shift the, that culture around analog and make it more accessible and just tell people that it can be learned, like it's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a co-op allows us, allows us to do that. Another thing is mentorship is really difficult. There is no long-term mentorship for artists anymore. Um, we were talking about this like uh, a while ago, but I think once you hit 35, all the opportunities disappear and there's no more funding. Um, when that's probably when you need the most support, but also when you have the most interesting ideas because of kind of the, the development that you've undergone, how you've evolved and how your ideas have mutated and the skills and knowledge and connections that you've built. So that is probably when you're most capable, but when you're least supported. Um, and so we wanted to also kind of intervene in this culture that kind of only celebrated the new and the young and the novel and didn't really provide long-term mentorship and long-term uh, support for artists. Um, and to be responsible for our own learning and our own development and our own growth and to not depend on funding cycles that kind of put us in competition with each other and create this, um, you know, sense of scarcity that we all have to be fighting for the same pot of funding. It's really quite unpleasant to, yeah, to be in community with people but to feel like you're constantly trying to undermine each other. I think that's just incredibly um, unhealthy creatively. Um, and so, yeah, we, we decided that being in a co-op, co owning our work and um, working collaboratively and being responsible for our own kind of um, development is actually better for us. And I think the last thing would be um, community in the sense that within the film industry, you kind of like, you go in, you do a project, you end, that's it and then you give it over to the distributor who then distributes your film. So you have no say actually over how people experience your film, where your films are shown, how they're shown. There's just no, that's not even a conversation. I think that's really a missed opportunity because it's just as important, like how people experience your film, who gets to experience your film is just as important as making the film. Um, and certain communities that I'm from in London, for example, never get to actually see my film. It goes around festival circuits and then maybe two, three years later, then they can see it. And I think that's really awful, especially when a lot of these films are made within a certain community. That community doesn't get to see it, legally cannot see it, until it's kind of then the festival rounds. And that's because of the hierarchical nature of film. So I think being able to um, own our films, being able to decide how we distribute them, being able to share them with our communities freely. Um, that's really important to us. So it's really three things like learning, making, and sharing film in the ways that we want to yeah. make, share, and learn from. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't it? I'd like to talk about uh, one of the challenges of being, working um, as a cooperative within this industry and also about solutions. 
come back to you, Richard, if I can. <laughs> so one of the challenges, I think, is that when... Uh, I don't know if it's the same for Ben. When you're working with uh, charities and co-ops and so on, and you're a co-op, there's a perception problem of you're not taken very seriously. It's like people think you're nice, but you're probably not very good at it, because if you were any good at it, you'd probably be working for a proper company. And I think this is not the only industry in which this happens, because I can see some nods in the room. So um, two solutions I can suggest. Uh, one that's worked really well for us is to enter for every bloody award that's going. So we've won a hell of a lot of awards, you know, from inside the charity sector and from outside World Television Society and so on. And that's something that kind of makes people think, oh, maybe they're not quite so rubbish. Um, and another sort of aspect of not being taken seriously for us has been not being taken seriously by the state in the sense that when there's business development money, it's for businesses but not for cooperatives, as if we weren't businesses. Mm -hmm. So listening to you, Richard, was just so um, really uplifting because I think if the uh, creative people of Birmingham, of whom there are masses, as you say, um, are going to get that kind of being taken seriously by the mayor, and that comes with serious money as well, and so on, that could really be the thing that could leapfrog people over into absolutely establishing that cooperatives are a really effective and sensible and business-like way of working within this sector. So what I would hope Birmingham would do would be to push the Labour Party and the about to become Labour government, I imagine, way beyond saying let's double the cooperative sector, which I think is quite unambitious. I think if you can leave in Birmingham and you can start tripling and quadrupling and quintupling the cooperative sector, then the rest of the UK can come trotting along behind. Yeah. Thank you. It's the right region, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, the West before, Midlands, I meant, of course. The West Midlands, of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> Before we go to questions, I'm going to come to, to Richard and Joe. I'm going to kind of put you together, really, um, because one, possibly may have mentioned, I'm a freelancer. So what is the role of freelancers within co-ops? But two, you've talked very passionately about, um, about the West Midlands and, and co-ops, but I suppose what, what are the opportunities here to kind of really do that for this sector? Well, uh, would you like to sort of kick off to talk about... Is that a microphone you've got in your hand, Richard? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, would so, you like to just kick off to talk about the ownership yes, of that? Yes, I be good. will, I will, that's fine. So, um, one of the things that we're doing in the West Midlands, which I hope will contribute towards the modest ambition of doubling the number of co-ops, is we have a, what we're calling an ownership hub. Um, and this is an initiative funded by Power to Change, delivered by Cooperatives UK, the Employee Ownership Association and the West Midlands Combined Authority Culture Team. And what we're aiming to do is to encourage, enable, facilitate the formation of co-ops um, and employee-owned businesses within the creative industries. We're focusing on that sector for now. We hope it will develop into other areas. So we're doing this in a number of different ways. Um, I firmly believe that this sort of work is all about forming relationships. Um, it's about listening to people, getting to know them where they are, and thinking about how the co-op model can support um, where appropriate. And so we're doing things like offering dream together workshops where if creatives have got ideas about what might make a good co-op, what might be a good solution to some of the problems that they're facing as freelancers or as people working in the creative industries, they can work with a creative developer or a co-op advisor depending on what's most useful for them to form their idea, see if it's got legs, and then there's the opportunity to apply for the business development programme that Co-ops UK offers, funded by the Co-op Bank. So we've got a sort of pathway from your dream, your idea, to becoming a fully formed co-op. We're also looking, offering um, what we're calling a succession starter seminar. So this is where organisations, arts organisations or businesses, who's going to own it? after them. This is often a problem and it's a problem in the arts where you have um, sort of niche 
organisations formed. And what they're looking for in terms of succession is a mini-me to take it over because who else is going to be able to do it? And needing that imagination to think, who could own this after me? Maybe our freelancers could own it. Maybe our audience could own it. So we're opening up that space. And all of this is free at the point of use. It's all funded by um, Power to Change. Um, and we will be assessing this model, seeing how it works, um, and it's going to be great, by the way, and hopefully developing it and um, rolling it out to other sectors with the support of our mayor. No, 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 thank you, and I'm really pleased that we've got this programme in place. Uh, and also, you know, I've been looking at the way in which something called the West Midlands Growth Company works. That's something the previous, previous mayor used to largely attract inward investment into this region, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I want that business uh, to spend more of its time working with young entrepreneurs and some of our SMEs in the region to help them grow and develop. So we, I use a phrase, rebuild our economy from the bottom up and the inside out. But that also includes, includes uh, helping uh, sh provide and share insight about different ways people can work together and collaborate. And this sector for me is, um, I, and I, you know, I don't know all the history about why we chose this sector, but I hope it was because I think this is a sector where this model, in the first instance, has more application and more resonance and relevance in almost any other sector. The, the concern I have uh, for people in this sector is um, the two things, it's scaling up activities and also um, how do we help uh, particularly young people uh, in these professions access the finance they need to invest in technology and other aspect, assets they need to progress. So I'm really, I'll be following the work we're leading at the Command Authority very closely. Um, the real test is uh, how we increase capacity and capability in the sector, but also that in itself uh, is not going to lead to success unless we create the jobs here that will allow those people to not just survive, but thrive in their chosen professions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have one last question for everyone. Um, listen to all of you, it seems to me there's a real natural fit between creativity, creative thinking and, and the co-op model. Um, am I wrong? Or, but like, right. Obviously I'm right. Um, but, but why do you think it is? Why do you think there's a natural... It just feels very synergist. Anyone? Um, I mean, at its best, you know, creativity is kind of about... Um, imagination and reimagining the world and it, it's kind of an alternative or like a different mode of being in the world or experiencing the world you know at least that's the aspiration um, and I think that lends itself quite naturally to um, yeah a different way of seeing the world and wanting to create the alter alternative forms of communication and of organization around it and I think in order to nurture that spirit you need a particular setup, you yeah. know. I think working within, a particular, you know, a certain institutional structure kind of kills that and diminishes it, and it becomes all about kind of logistics and operations and profit and other things that kind of take up more space than the creativity itself. I think co-op model really allows the creativity to thrive and to breathe and to be kind of the leading leading force that connects not just members of the co-op, at least in not nowhere, but how we connect to our, to our community. Um, and yeah, I think for, also speaking about film specifically, because we are a film co-op. Um, I mean, I, I, besides not know where I work at a um, community cinema in North London called Other Cinemas. Um, and I think film inherently is about collectivity. You watch something together. You kind of share space and time together and you speak about it afterwards, you share your thoughts, your feelings, your frustrations. Um, so I think it's a very natural way of bringing people together. Um, and I think, yeah, through that coming together, you kind of, um, e even film as a, as a vocation kind of is about working with other people. Yeah. You can't get a film done <laughs> unless you have a team, yeah. unless you have collaborators. <laughs> even things like writing that are seen as more isolated things actually are always in com conversation with collective memory or collective experiences, or you're speaking with or against something, you know? And so there's, I think, a natural collective spirit and nature to creativity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
Oh, sorry, Ben. I was going to say, following on from that, with the business model side of thing as well, I think um, co-ops are very, very flexible. There's lots of different types of co-ops, and that has, can be a downside for people to understand what co-ops are, because there's so many different structures, and some are equal pay, some are different, and you know, you can have all these, you can have these consortium co-op, you can be a worker co-op. There's lots of confusion there, but at the same time, for the creative industries, that means you can adapt your model to fit. So even just in like with the design, like create like in agencies like ours, the like co-ops, there's still lots of different models that people are using. So you get, it does give you that flexibility, which suits creatives I think quite well, especially all the different types of industries. Whether that's film might have a very different structure sometimes to like a design studio or advertising, and there's all these different models which suit different types of creative agencies better as well. So I think that's like a really, um, that comes like a very good fit because of the flexibility that you've got in the model. And you can change that model over time as well, um, which I think works really well. Okay. I would say it's not limited to what are officially the creative industries. I don't think there's any human endeavor which doesn't involve some creativity. And I think just as Grace was saying earlier in the keynote, I think when you're feeling disempowered and there's a hierarchy on top of your head, then nobody's creativity has got much chance to flow. Whereas if you own the uh, company that you work for and you are part of it, then whatever it is that you're doing, whether it officially counts as creative or not, you're going to do it better. Thank you. Um, I think it's the community aspect, just to add to it. I love what Lucinda says about flow. For me, my central image about creativity is this is, it's a river that flows through the cosmos and it generated the earth and it generated each one of us and it's in all of us. Um, I think creatives understand that and so it's very, and when I say creative, sorry, I, sorry, people working in the creative industries, we're all creative. Um, and so I think it's very natural to therefore want to encourage the creativity in the people in the community around you. We don't need to be told that it's important for health and well-being. You know, you accountants can go along and measure that if you want, but, but we just know that it is. And so that working with the community is something that comes naturally, I think, to people who work in the creative industries. Thank you. And Richard. Uh, I, would, I would use one word, I think. Uh, I remember during my life, I worked for some larger organisations, but I was happiest when I had autonomy really over yeah. what I was doing. And I think that's the word I would use. And um, that gives you the freedom uh, and it's an incredibly rewarding position to be in. And uh, in this sector, I'm not too, you know, the great creative breakthroughs the great writers, uh, the artists, others, um, I'm not sure well, none of that would have come from, you know, people working within a corporate environment. So, uh, so for me, I think it's autonomy was, would be the one year that I would, I would use. Thank you. I think we've got time for... Have we, have we got any questions? No questions. <laughs> Hayley. Oh, yeah, Rose. Is as <laughs> uh, you've, you've chosen to structure your creative businesses as co-ops and I'm interested in two things one like was that a conscious decision from the beginning or did that evolve and, and, and how did that come about and secondly amongst your peers of creatives and culture to the conversation we were having this morning do you think people in the creative industries and people you work with know and understand about all these merits that you've been talking about today Yes and no. Yes, it was conscious, and no, it's not well enough understood in the creative industries any more than it is understood sufficiently in any other industries, would be my answer. Yeah, and I think some people as well, yeah, I think it definitely the, the awareness there of co-ops is 
it's growing, I think, it is growing, but yeah, there's a lot more, there's still a massive confusion with the co-op is the retail store down the road, and it's quite unfortunate that the retail stores are called the co-ops, I think, because it just confuses people with a, like a business model. It's a bit like calling in Tesco's the limited company. You know, so there's, this <laughs> massive, there's this massive thing there, but I think it is, in, I think it is improving, um, and that awareness yeah, it is getting better, and I think um, when people join co-ops as well, I think some are some are really interested in all the things that it brings, and you still have some people are less interested, and some want to get more involved and less involved. So we try and kind of like adapt to people can get involved as much as they want as well with that side of things. Yeah, I would agree that I don't think people have the knowledge or the tools to realise that there are like other ways of um, organising their work. Uh, or of working collectively. Um, I think also like the amount of work and responsibility that it takes to work within a co-op structure really puts people off, I think. But I don't think they think about the reward that comes with that. So I think, yeah, it's, um, it's definitely something that's like growing. Um, but I don't think it's, um, yeah, I don't think it's seen as a legitimate option yet. Yeah, I think people maybe feel safe working within in institutions or within an existing uh, film economy, um, and they don't see like alternatives to that. Yeah, I, I think it's it's significant that Ben's Co-op Creative Co-op and our Co-op Media Co-op, we both put Co-op in the name. Yeah. I think that means something. Yeah. I, th I think it's right. I, I was the director for Business Link for eight years, running their creative interests programs and, uh, across the West Midlands. And that was the largest in the country. I don't think we worked with one Co-op, um, and it was only when I was talking to Joe this week about freelancers that I knew there was a model for free. So, you know, I'm somebody who's fairly informed on those structures. So I think um, uh, I'm going to kind of leave it with, with Richard, really, because uh, you've said it on a stage now. So now we can make it... I think it'd be really interesting to see far more commitment to co-ops in this sector, particularly in the West Midlands. And I think, from my point of view, because as, as, I'm going to have the last word, um, it is actually because of the, the circumstance of this region. Is that there, are, there are a lot of people, particularly people of colour, who are not not really represented in this region. Um, in fact, I only mentor, voluntary life, I only mentor artists of colour in Birmingham uh, because of the lack of opportunities they have. At least I can kind of give that, that platform. So I think this is a real chance for this region to start taking that. And, um, and, and, and I think that the, the lovely thing, the thing I loved when Jay told me about this was the dream workshops, to actually take a step back from the corporate... Because even in the sector, there's a, there's a corporate structure. I loved that. When you said there was dream workshops, I thought... To have that, that chance to dream and think is, is how you kind of create, I think, this space. So um, I hope next time when you're, when you're at your next conference, the West Midlands will have all of these kind of developing co-ops um, from the West Midlands in this sector, because that, would, for me, would be a really um, wonderful achievement. Um, thank you. I'd like to say thank you to everyone on the panel. It's been really interesting. So Lena, uh, Ben, Lucinda, uh, Joe and Richard, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.